Bye-bye. Yolanda, you are on mute. Yeah, Sherry? Okay. So welcome, welcome. It's really, um, Glenn and I've been looking forward to this because we work with several colleagues in our circle uh, who do, do Agile and um, Olaf has worked with us in the past and he uh, called and said, emailed us and said, do you think you'd be interested in doing this? And we said, of course, of course, of course. So uh, we're really pleased uh, that that you, you're here this evening and the things that we want to talk about. Um, we're really talking about how do you work in, excuse me, in complexity? How can, how can you use Agile to really act with courage and move forward when it feels like you can't do anything? So Glenn, did you want to move us forward? Thanks. So in in human systems dynamics, we're a relatively, I guess, middle-aged company. We've been around for almost 20 years um, and we're, uh, we do consulting and training. Uh, we write, we do things in, in human systems dynamics is a way of looking at the world and understanding the world so that we see into the complexity and are able to take action from what we see. Two years ago, we did some updating and some visioning for the future. And this is the vision that we came up with, that people everywhere thrive because we see patterns clearly, we seek to understand and act with courage to turn turbulent, to transform turbulence and uncertainty into possibility for all. And what we mean by that is that this vision is not gonna happen someday. It's that every single day we're working to make this vision a reality in our work, in the Institute's work, and in the work of our clients, and helping others who come to us for training or whom we meet in situations like this. So that's, that's, what, that's what we're working for every day. When we do that, we use a short list of simple rules that help to inform all of our decision making. And it's a part of our work, it's a part of what we do to help organizations work is develop a list of simple rules. And these are ours. First, we stand in inquiry. And we're gonna talk about that some more later this evening, but these four practices are how we do it. We turn judgments into curiosity, uh, conflict <clears throat> into shared exploration, defensiveness into self-reflection, and assumptions into questions. And so Glenda is going to be talking about that a little bit more later, but that's one of our simple rules, stand in inquiry. The second is that we find energy in difference. As a human systems move, it's the differences that trigger us or push us or compel us into change and into noticing uh, the ways that we can shift in a system. The third is to zoom in and look at the specifics and zoom out to see more generality. Zoom in to see the small parts of the system, zoom out to see the larger parts. We connect through stories and impact. So we'll be telling some stories this evening as we move along. We search for what's both true and useful. There's a lot of stuff out there that's true, but maybe not very useful. And there's a lot of stuff that's pretty useful, but it may not be true. And so we search for both. That's one of the questions we ask ourselves. And then ultimately we celebrate life. As we look into the future, we know that there may be challenges, there will be challenges uh, in lots of different areas. And it's not about everything's a party, but it is about the possibility of life and what can come from life and how we move forward in that life. And that's what we choose to celebrate. So as we talk with y'all and, and interact with you through the evening, we really would like to know if you see these come into, if you see us living out these simple rules. And there are a couple of things we, will, we invite you to do. Um, as we talk, please feel free to chat in the chat space, exchange information with each other, put questions there. Volca and Alina have a, a promise to bring the questions forward as they come. So don't hesitate to put chat there 
we don't consider it rude. We we want an ongoing kind of conversation more than we want to be doing a lecture. The other is if if there's something that you want to know, speak up, raise your hand, use your uh, the reaction and raise your hand so that we see uh, uh, that that there is a question right there and we will be able to answer it. Glenn, is there anything or at least address it, if not answer it? Glenn, is there anything else you wanted to add? There are just a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, it may be helpful since many of them don't know us. We might just want to take a minute to introduce each other and ourselves. Oh, there's that. Uh, so um, I'm Glenda O. Young. I'm the executive director of the Human Systems Dynamics Institute. And since the late 1980s, I've been digging into the nonlinear sciences, complexity and chaos, and finding nuggets of helpful information to use in human systems. So for individual growth and development, for teams, for organization development, communities, and now global patterns of transformation. And um, as Roy said, Olaf is one of our colleagues and associates. We have a network of about 900 people around the world who use human systems dynamics, each of them in a very unique way. And you are welcome to use anything you learn from us whenever and however you find it useful. We just have two requests. One is that you cite the source and the second is that you teach back. So we are passionate that this work be shared across the world and all the places where it's useful. So please take it, put it in your pocket, take it with you. So Royce, do you want to introduce yourself a bit? Sure. And I'm saying Sue is pointing out that there's some agency associates in Singapore. That's exactly right. One of our board members, Sue uh, Sim, uh, lives in Singapore. And uh, she has been with us a while and now she sits on our board as a member. My name is Royce Holiday, as you can see from my tag. Um, and I spent years in education, 25 years in public education as a teacher and a counselor and a district level administrator. And when we op when Glenda opened the institute in the year 2000, uh, I came, I left public education and began working with her because I always knew that the things that I was learning would say to us, here's the system, the system is broken, and here's how you operate in a broken system. And I kept wanting to say, but how do you fix the system? And so when I began, Glenda began working in, HS, in, in complexity and then later developed the field of HSD, I knew that this is a way not to fix the system necessarily, but to see it and understand it in a way that would inform action differently than if I were just doing workarounds. And so the work that we've done in organizations and with folks, and now to be able to work with those of you who use Agile to begin to build those systems from the beginning, it's, it's quite an honor to be able to uh, learn from you and work with you. We have a, quite a number of associates who are in the Agile field and who uh, contribute and do that work. Uh, Glenda was talking just a few minutes ago about uh, the work she's doing with uh, Michael this week uh, and, and Marie in over the next few weeks in, about some of the dragons, uh, the, the old ways of thinking that um, HSD can help us think differently about. But that's what we do um, and we, as Glenda said, we. Michael Spade and Marie Murtogas, right? And um, that's, that's what we do and who we are. And um, we're glad, we are glad to be here with you this evening. So, yeah. So we have, we're gonna talk a little bit later, but we always start with the what. What do we see? What is it? What's the core? What is the essence of the challenge or the pieces that we bring together? in our work. And so this evening, we're gonna be thinking about what, what is complexity? What are the kinds of complexity? What is, it that, what is it that is in complexity that makes our work so hard and that makes our work so important? Then we're gonna talk a little bit about so what? So when, once we know what 
going, what, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what are the patterns we see, then we can begin to make sense of them. And as we make sense of them, then we begin to see things that give us more options for action. So that then we move into a stage that we call the now what, which is our action stage. And for so many years, I spent time at conference tables and it was like, we're going, what, now what, what, now what, what, now what? And we didn't take the time for the so what, the sense making in the middle. And so that's what our tools offer. That's what HSD offers is some, some way of making sense of the patterns that we see that really open up those options for action. And when we first start talking about systems, one of the what, the first what that we kind of like to talk about is what is a complex adaptive system? So, yeah. So this is a picture we work a lot with models that we believe represent reality. Uh, they represent not reality, but they represent reality. They are not reality, but they re represent reality. And if you look at this, you've got the little green arrow, the purple arrowhead and the green hexagon and the uh, orange oval. We think of those as agents in a system. And they, you can think of them as people who work in a system, the departments in an organization. You can even think of them as individual ideas that come together to form a concept. But right now, let's think of them as people. So you have agents, the people in a system, your family, for instance, and you interact with each other and you interact in different ways. People have their own personalities. They bring their own information. They have their role, their responsibility, the accountability they have. But given all those individual pieces about each of us, we work together and we generate patterns that become overarching patterns in the system. And that's what those circles at the top represent. So you can think about your own family. In our family, as we li lived in oh, transparency, Glenn and our sisters, I forgot to say that earlier. <laughs> We're sisters and we work together. So as we grew up in, a in our family, there were patterns that emerged over time. Our mother was, our, both our parents were school teachers. And so that expectation, the pattern of, yes, you're going to college, don't worry about it. Yes, you're gonna, you, you are to be a good student. Yes, right? And the valuing of people, we grew up in, in uh, the Methodist church. And so the, the values that were imbued in that. So the, the ways that we were brought up created patterns that then reinforce even today in some ways, the ways that Glenda and I interact and think. And so the patterns that dominate in a certain system are those that are able then to say, somebody new comes in and says, well, how do I be here? And you look around and you go, oh, this is how people behave because they're seeing the patterns. So when we're talking about a pattern and a complex step system this evening, I invite you to think about a, a group that you work with at work or think about the family where you live or the neighborhood where you live and work and play. But think about these ideas in the context of people that you're with, in the context of your own life, so that you're automatically bringing it into meaning uh, and what it might mean in your, your life. So did you have anything to add about a complex adaptive system? Oh, thanks, Royce. I think one of the things that's very important in the agile space is that when you think about the fundamental structures of agile, you can see how they're setting conditions for different kinds of agents to come together and interact to create patterns that are productivity and quality and customer satisfaction and that those work the work that you do those of you who are coaches those of you who work on the line those of you who have various relationships you can see I think of most agile groups as being combinations of multiple complex adaptive systems all of which are linking to each other so one of the reasons it's really fun for us to work with agilists is that you have an, a kind of intuitive sense of what it means to have agents come together generate something that then persists over time yeah 
So in that space, thank you, Royce. I'm curious, are there any questions or comments about complex adaptive systems? Is this a, an image that's familiar to you? Here's a question. Um, does SSD have a view on courage in something two mountains? Complexity and official status. Two mountains. Who, if whoever asked that can speak it out, that would be really helpful. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I, I'm Xu Wang, currently based in Singapore. Uh, one of the typical scenario that I usually experience about complexity and influence is the people who are interested usually are probably in a relatively lower social and official status. Oh. And therefore, a lot of time you talk about courage and the pushback is always, I am i can't do this, I don't have that. And therefore, courage seems to be what we don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lovely question. In fact, I was working with a group in the Dutch government today about asking, where do you enter a system? Should you enter with individuals in the bureaucracy or in high level management or with the politicians or with the public, where should you enter? So in a complex system, there are multiple scales and levels. So you can imagine this as an individual person's work life. And so they organize their own work and can use this to you to make courageous decisions in their own space, in their own context. They can also draw others into the context and it can be larger and larger. You can think of the CEO of an organization has something just like this. It's just that the agents are different and the interactions are different. And so the patterns are different. And so what we do as we work with organizations is to help everyone see that this process is happening and make choices to contribute to the pattern they want to create. And the courage of being able to ask a question. So we're going to look at three tools today that you can use to interact with a complex system. And one of them has to do with questions. And so in a moment when you see something, if you can change that sight, that vision into a really powerful question, then you have an interaction that is open and sharing and not testing. And so it gives you more courage because you don't have to have so much courage. Now, and I should also say here, HSD doesn't give answers because in a complex system, every moment is unique and every place is different. And so if we gave you an answer and told you what would work, in North Carolina, you would take it to Singapore and it would not work. But if we share with you a question, it will work here and there and in the Bay Area. It will work today and tomorrow and the next day. And so we believe that questions are really what you need to work in complexity, that answers are just going to have a shelf, short shelf life. They're not going to last very long. That's a lovely question, and I suspect that others in the room sense it as well. Can I add one thing, Glenda? Mm -hmm. One of the things that this process of doing what, so what, now what, we call that adaptive action. We're going to talk more about it in a minute. But one thing that we can't do someone else's adaptive action. We're losing your voice, I think, Royce. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you slow down a little bit, that might help. Okay. So let me check my Bluetooth. Yeah, it's on. So I can't do a CEO's work. What I can do is advocate for what I need. Mm -hmm. Now your headset is off, Royce. We Royce, don't... we're not hearing you at all. Okay, glad so, to Okay, I will. I will. What, what she was saying was, in the adaptive action, you can only do your own work. 
you can't do somebody else's work as well. And so it's very important that you do your own work with courage, but not worry about telling somebody else how they should do their work. So we'll see that when we talk about adaptive action. So one of the things that's really key is when we say complexity, we don't just mean one thing. And we also don't mean the four things in the Kinefin. So my suspicion is that many of you know about Dave Snowden's work in Kinefin, where he talks about simple, complex, complicated, and chaotic. And we look into the, to the world of the complex rather than looking at the other three. We focus on the complex. And within the complex, we see four different kinds of perceptions. And I just want to share those with you briefly, because I think they'll be familiar to you in your practice. So the first kind of complexity is detail complexity. And that means that there's so many different pieces and parts that everything is surprising. There are too many pieces to pay attention to at the same time. That's a kind of complexity because it's based on detail. And often you'll find confusion and you're worried about things. And what you do when you come to that kind of complexity is to cluster and label. So if you can find some way in all the mess and all the different details that you're looking at, if you can find ways to cluster them and then label them, then it reduces the number of agents you need to deal with. And this is some other information about detailed complexity. So think about the times when you feel overwhelmed with a complex system because there are too many variations in it in a moment. That's a particular kind. A second kind of complexity we call nonlinear complexity. And this is where everything is connected to everything else. So you pull a thread and something else moves. And in ways you don't know, those interconnections are so powerful that you dare not do anything because you don't know what the consequence is going to be. So that's a different kind of complexity. You may be familiar with that in your projects. I'm seeing some smiles in the room as you're finding some familiarity in that. And in that case, what you do is zoom in on an individual agent and ask how they are connected. So you look at any pair. So rather than looking at all the many connections, you zoom in and look at one, and then you zoom out and look at the whole, and then you zoom back in again. So that you're thinking either about the close in or the far out view. It's why one of our rules is that. And you begin to assess the exchanges and connections that are there. So that's the second kind. The third kind of complexity is uncertainty complexity. And this is when the boundaries of a system are open and strange things can come in and you don't control what other people do or what might be present in the system. I think many of us who were working in supply chain throughout COVID were in the real mess of uncertainty complexity, not knowing what would come next. Many of us personally as well as professionally were in uncertainty complexity. And in that space, you ask a variety of questions, of course, if you don't know. So one question is, so what do we know for sure? Even if things are uncertain, there's something you know for sure. And what do we wonder? So what are the questions you're going to have? And the third question is, what is unknowable? No matter how much I think or talk about it today, I'm not going to know it. And for those things, you don't waste time and energy. You just put them over to the side. You'll come back to them. But how often do you spend time in uncertainty complexity, chewing on things that are totally unknowable? That's wasted time and energy that you can focus instead on the things that are either known or knowable. And the final kind is the kind that human systems dynamics works on most deeply, and that's pattern complexity. And that's what we're talking about today. And in pattern complexity, we consider the deep structures that influence how those patterns frame 
in a complex adaptive system? What is it about the agents that are interacting? What is it about the ways they interact? What is it about the things that focus them and hold them together that influence what kinds of patterns emerge? And then once those patterns emerge, how do they propagate? And so that's our work in complex adaptive systems. And those are the tools we're going to share with you are ones that are particularly helpful in pattern complexity. And by the way, these same tools will also help you with the other three kind. So I'm just going to pause there for a minute. Those of you who know Dave Snowden's work in, in Kinefin, you can imagine that this is sitting inside the complexity quadrant. I know he doesn't call them quadrants. He and I have been in probably in decades of conversation by now. So I'm curious if anybody has questions about any one of the, these or about the approach. Yeah, Royce. I was just going to say, yes, Joe, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. When Glenda says CDE, she's talking about containers. What holds the system together is the C. Differences are the differences that make a difference inside that container. And the E are the exchanges or the connections that hold people that share information, energy across the system. CDE. Good job. Yeah. That's, and that's the core of pattern logic. I should also say that this table emerged in work with a fellow named Steve Hoyer, whom some of you may know. He's an agilist. Um, and he and I were working on a project together, and this emerged from that. But what we'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about what are some options for action. So if you find yourself in any one of these kinds of complexity, what can you do? How do you approach it? And Royce is going to talk about the first, which she's already begun. Are you ready, Royce? So I think you're on mute. Yes. Yes. So we're going to start with adaptive action, and, and I spoke to it earlier. But it's three questions. It's a very simple cycle, iterative cycle of what's going on, so what does it mean? Now, what am I going to do? And it's simple, three questions. And it's not so different from other uh, problem solving uh, processes you may know, except that when we move into the so what, that's when we're looking into the patterns themselves. So Linda just talked about patterns and the adaptive action cycle can go as quickly as a heartbeat, or it can take a year, right? So it's how fast can we do that? In the what, you say, what's happening right now? What are people saying? What do we know for sure? What are they doing? What, did, what do I see? What's the essence of what I'm looking at? And pick those things that have, seem to have the most meaning, and you say, okay, now, now that I have these patterns that I've looked at, I'm going to spend some time saying, so what do we see? What 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 resources are not being used? What does this mean here? What what kinds of options do we have for action? What what's not there that we still need to go get more in, information about? What would work in this situation? What fits the need? What is not fit for function in this situation? What is? And in looking through that, then you're combing through and you're teasing out different options that you can take for action. And then you pick one and then you move into the now what and say, now, here's what we're going to do right now. Here's the plan for it. We'll know we're done when or we we'll are look for this change. We measure it and we're going to talk to people about it. Now, what are we going to do? And you put whatever change, whatever intervention you planned, you put it in operation and say, so what's this impact? And then you're moving into the next what to say, so what difference did that make? And so it's cyclical and iterative because each time you go through the cycle, you're learning a bit more about the system itself. So we what, so what, now what? And 
Joe's, Joe's question about the CDE a while ago. That comes it, when we get into the so what we're saying. So what shapes these patterns? What conditions are set? What are the containers? What are the differences? What are the exchanges? Because if I can shift one of those, I can shift a pattern. It might not be a big shift, but it may be a smaller one. And so once you identify and you say, this pattern's worked fine, but this one is not working. And as Olaf just wrote, what we do is we say, what are the conditions that are shaping that pattern that are not working so that I can damp or in influence that pattern? Or what are the conditions that are shaping the patterns that are working really well and how do I amplify those? So it opens up a whole realm of action and so it, it's moving into that question about what is it that I can do to shift the conditions of the patterns that are in my cycle right here. And when I realize there's someone who has more power, it gives me a clear way of asking for what I need or for advocating for what I need, because I am much clearer about the specifics of what I need, because I'm, I'm talking about the dynamics of this pattern rather than the pattern in general. And power itself is a pattern. The way that we use power in a system is a pattern. That's right. Um, other questions or thoughts? Ola, do you have any questions or comments to add? Or Linda, how about you? I'm curious if Olaf would like to speak. Um, yeah. Anything you'd like I to mean, share? <laughs> I think the way that uh, people in the Agile community are most familiar with this is that the, these three questions form the core of the retrospective uh, process. Uh, Esther Derby, one of your associates, brought this into the fold of Agile by saying retrospectives, we start with an opening, we do a what, a so what, a now what, and then we do a close. Right? And so we all mm -hmm. We are all very familiar with this pattern because Esther brought it into the community. And, That's lovely. That's lovely. Um, she, she was and working Diana on. Larson. Yeah, and Dan, Diana Larson. So when Esther came to go through the training, she was working on her retrospectus book, and every day she'd go upstairs and rewrite another chapter because she realized that adaptive action was such a great core for that. And Diana used it deeply in her liftoff book as well. Yeah. It's it's exciting that it's become so much a part of the language. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thanks for bringing their their um, thoughts into the room, Ola. Yeah. And it's easy to get stuck in what thinking that you have to have all the data in the world to be able to move yeah. forward, and that will stop you. It's also easy to get stuck in so what because. I think we call that analysis paralysis. Maybe there's one more way I can look at this. Maybe there's something perfect I can do rather than just the next best thing. And it's easy to get stuck in now what when you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over because you don't know what else to do. And so it's not that you don't get stuck when you know about, HS, about HSD or about the adaptive action. It's that when you get stuck, you can get unstuck easily. So are we ready for inquiry, Royce? Let me, let me say one more thing. Mm -hmm. And that is this, that one of the beauties of adaptive action is that the cycle can be very short. So when you make a decision and take an action, you're not changing something for the next year. You can come back to it and move into your next cycle and know whether or not it's working and make the shift at that time, rather than thinking, I can't do this till next year or next year, or when our next strategic plan is or whatever. So it's it's being able to make forced corrections in an ongoing basis. So, yeah, now, and this is how you know. The very definition of agile, isn't it? Very definition of agile. So the second tool that we want to look at is called the rules for inquiry. And one of the things we realized very early was that in com complex systems, you seldom are certain. 
If you are certain, that's easy. You can just do that. So those things happen. But when you're stuck and you don't know what's going to happen, the surprise, the uncertainty, the indeterminacy of a complex system, answers aren't all that useful, but inquiry is. And so we talked often about inquiry and people kept saying, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? How do I do that? I know I'm supposed to be asking questions, but how do I do that? And so these four simple rules help people in the moment find questions to ask and help us help each other find questions to ask. So the first question is, how do you turn judgment into curiosity? That's the first rule. So if you feel judgment, how do you turn that into curiosity? If you believe that people above you aren't paying attention and aren't listening and don't have the information they need, how do you shift that judgment into curiosity? And as you do that, rather than having a block in the system, there's a flow things begin to move. Now, it's not always easy to find a useful question. We're going to work on that in a minute because it's easy to ask a question like, what's the matter with you, buddy? <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> That's not a question. So the questions need to be open, open-ended, something you really don't know, and something that would make a difference in what you use. Some people call it a clean question. So turning your judgment into curiosity. The second rule is to turn disagreement into shared exploration. Now, this is one where if there's disagreement in a system, and I'm sure you see this in teams, where there are two people or two teams that are at loggerheads with each other, they're conflicted, all of the energy in the system is focused in that point. It becomes a kind of sink, an energy sink that sucks all the energy from the system. If instead those two perspectives can work together in exploration about something that they share, about some question that's important to both of them, then they can move forward. It doesn't mean that those disagreements go away, but it means that they get out of the way so you can continue to move forward. Disagreements into shared exploration. The third rule is to turn defensiveness into self-reflection. And this is particularly important for experts at a time of change. Experts are experts because they know answers. And when an expert gets thrown into a complex system and suddenly doesn't know the answers, an automatic response is defensiveness. To say, well, it used to work, or it should work, or it would work. Somebody else's fault it didn't work. And I wonder if any of you have that sense as well for yourselves. So if you think about a particular issue you're working on, is defensiveness a trap for you? And can you turn it into self-reflection? So asking questions like, what am I defending? What am I afraid to lose? What is it that's surprising me? When did I begin to feel this way? In what conditions do I feel this way? When do I not feel this way? All of those questions help you build your capacity. We call it adaptive capacity to be able to stand in a place of change and not feel frozen in that moment. And fourth rule is to turn assumptions into questions. Now, this one's tricky because you can't do it by yourself. In the same way a fish doesn't know water, we don't know our own assumptions. And so we have to work with our partners and our colleagues and our co-programmers to be able to test what are those assumptions that we're carrying. Now, this one's hard for me because when somebody steps on my assumptions, the first thing I do is get defensive and irritated and a little angry, you know, that they don't see something true as I see true. And so when I feel that, that becomes for me a flag to pause and breathe and say, all right, where are my assumptions being stepped on? And how can I turn those into questions? 
Now we use, in order to help us kind of practice these rules, we use this table and you're welcome to take a picture of it with your phone or to use it. We'll be sharing the slides with you later. But in this, it brings together adaptive action and the rules for inquiry. And so you say, beginning with what, what judgments am I feeling? What's the conflict that affects this? What are the defensiveness in me or in others? What are the assumptions I'm holding? So you fill out the what as completely as you can, given what you know. That's step one. Step two is you ask yourself, so what is the impact of judgment or conflict or defensiveness or assumptions? How is that getting in my way or helping me? Which of these is most cogent, most troublesome in this very moment? And then you zero in on that one. And then you say, well, now what can I do to shift it? So let's say I'm here and I say, I've got real, it's the conflict pattern, which is really stopping the work I need to do. Then you say, now what is one tiny action I can do that will begin to move that relationship towards shared exploration? And so this helps you solidify and document, make concrete what you're thinking about. Another thing that we found is using this with a group really cools down a disagreement. So if I'm disagreeing with someone or we're seeing things very differently or we're in some kind of tension, trying to make a decision together, using something like this helps you rather than thinking the challenge is between you and them, you can put this on the wall and work through shared exploration, seeing the issue there as well. So I'm going to pause again and ask Roy Splitz in chat or ask Olaf, if there is a reflection he'd like to share, or are there questions? I have a story I can tell in a minute. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions. I just want to um, follow up with something Glenda said. Uh, it's really nice to have someone help you with your assumptions, but also if, if you have somebody in your life, I call them nag buddies, who can help you get out of that. So. For instance, I sit down at dinner in the evenings and I'm furious about something. I, a bad customer call, so I, I didn't get help from customer service. Them. And, and I might be ranting about it. And Glenda will let me rant. And then she says, so where's the curiosity in that, Roy? Or if I'm, if I'm feeling defensive, she'll, she'll, say, she'll ask me, what, what button are they pushing? Or what, what is it that you're assuming should have happened, right? So I have her as a way, and I provide her the same service, by the way, um, to, to help me, remind me of these things. We've had, we've had colleagues and friends who put them on sticky notes and put them above with their computers. We've had people, we, at one client we had um, printed them onto business cards and then poked holes in the end and had people put them onto their lanyards, their ID lanyards, so that they always had the questions with them. So there are ways that you can find to help remember these and help you stand in inquiry when, when it's really easy not to sometimes. Oh, the torment so we really, doors. We really want to hear Ola's story. So can we hear it? Exactly. That'd be great, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> as you were talking on some of the previous slides about the cycle of the adaptive action cycle, what, so what, now what, and then about experts uh, sometimes falling into defensiveness, I, I had a moment of defensiveness. I fell into the expert trap. I was talking to uh, my manager. We were talking about some, some metrics and graphs and things, and I had dug into how they were being produced, <clears throat> and I had found a way to make them show more what he was looking for. And so I said to him, um, 
you know, you think that the graph works this way, but it actually doesn't. It works like this because I looked at it and he was like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. See what it says above? It says it works like this. And I was like, okay, I can see that this isn't going anywhere. So let me back off. And luckily I had someone else in the meeting with me who, who then kind of took, took a side road and started talking about, oh, you're, you're not actually sharing what you think you're sharing on screen right now. So she kind of helped me diffuse my own like defensiveness in the moment. And afterwards, I actually went to a colleague who my boss had worked with for figuring out this graph. And I said to him, how do I work with my boss better so that, 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 that we get better understanding of each other's positions? And, and how is this graph actually constructed? What can you tell me about how, how this is constructed? And he said, oh, well, it's not done yet. We want to get it to this thing that it says above the graph in a comment, but we're not there yet. In fact, I've been working with someone else to try to get it to that place, but it isn't there yet. So that whole like getting distance from the situation in the moment, the defensiveness, the assumptions, the judgments that we both had going on on each side, it really helped me figure out, okay, this isn't working. Oh, that's such a great example. And what it shows is that sometimes when we're in the middle of a complex experience, we feel like we're stuck, like there's only one way forward and you can't go that way. And by pausing and using the simple rules or doing adaptive action or the power of questions, which we're going to do next, it opens up that space and suddenly you have more degrees of freedom to be able to choose a path that's graceful and possible. So you are opening gateways all along to be able to do that. Thanks for that story. It's a great story. And I, love it mm -hmm. I, um, I love what I love what I was said because he went uh, uh, judgment to curiosity. He also went through defensiveness because he thought he was wrong and turned that into self-reflection. His assumption was that the thing was finished and what he found out was that it wasn't. So he basically used all four of those in that one situation. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So we have one other tool that we want to share with you before we turn toward questions. And we plan to have questions for the last 30 minutes and we are going to close definitely at the top of the hour. Um, and the last one is an extension of questioning. And we call it the power of questions. And Royce is going to share it with you a little bit. All right. So this is a practice that we have created um, to help us think about how, did, how can you help other people crack the nut of a challenge that is really getting to them. And so it's a very quick practice that can be done just in minutes. Uh, and it's one that we offer to anybody who's willing to show up at 10 o'clock central time every day of the week, weekdays, um, and spend 30 minutes with us. Someone will bring what we call a wicked issue or a challenge they can't figure out someplace they're stuck. One person will tell their challenge and then everybody else in the room will ask questions for about 15 minutes. So in that time, this perfect, perfect person is not defending, not trying to answer, not trying to respond. They're just listening to the question. And what we find this does is that it opens that space for questioning. It opens that space so that you're not stuck on one answer or I have to have the right answer or whatever. It opens your creativity to listen to these different questions so that you can think more broadly and more deeply into the dynamics of what's going on. And the questions have, you have to be careful about the questions too, because as Linda said a while ago, you need questions that are open-ended. It's not a yes, no sort of thing. It's also not hidden advice. Well, have you ever thought about doing this? That's advice, that's not an open-ended question. And it's about one that you don't know the answer to. Sometimes we use metaphors in our questions. Sometimes we ask direct questions about what else is going on. Sometimes we use experiential questions. So it's, it's 25 minutes of asking different questions. So Glenn and I'll tell you, do, do you wanna 
do you think we have time, Glenda, to do this for a minute or two? Yes. Okay. So what we'd like is, um, Glenda, why don't you set it up? You did this really in a cool way the other day. So what I'd like for you to do is to think about some wicked issue you're dealing with. And it can be personal, it can be you know, the team, it can be whatever, it's just a problem, whatever's keeping you awake. And if you would, on a piece of paper or someplace, write down just a quick sentence to describe what that problem is. Describe it as briefly as you can. We'll give you one minute. Don't edit yourself. There's no such thing as a perfect description of a wicked issue. Whatever you write down is the right thing. Exactly. All right, about 10 more seconds. All right, pencils down, as we say in contest time. Take a deep breath, if you would. And we're going to ask you some questions. And what we'd like for you to do is just to reflect on your wicked issue in the context of these questions. Now, if we had more time, we'd break you up in pairs and each of you would talk to one other person about it and ask questions. But in this case, those of us who are familiar with the process, including Olaf and Royce and me, and if there's anybody else online who'd like to share questions, you can open your mic and share them. But what we'd like for you to do is to see what you can see, the so what of your wicked issue as we ask questions. So Royce, where would you like to start? So if this question had a collar, what color would it be? Thank you. When were you very first aware of this issue? And what happened right before that? What if you zoomed out really far? What would it look like from there? When you look at this, what do you wonder? What do you not know that you need to know? In this wicked issue, what's the center of it and what's the edge of it? How would you explain this issue to a five-year-old? How how is this issue like a children's story? Three bears, Wicked Witch of the West, and in the children's story, what what did you learn from a children's story? If you think of all the wise people you've ever known, which of them could help you, and what would they say? What would your mother tell you about this problem? What would your father tell you about this problem? What would be the best possible outcome here? What would be the worst possible outcome here? Let's do one more round. I think we have time for one more round. So okay. mine is, when you think of this issue, how do you feel it in your body? What tension sits in your somatic space? Oh, do you have a final question you want to ask? No. Okay. 
I'll ask a final question. If this challenge were a dance, what kind of dance would it be? A cha-cha, a walk, a two-step, the jerk? What kind of dance would it be? I like the jerk, Rice. That's good. <laughs> so now, if you would, please just take a deep breath. And ask yourself, now what? What shifted for you with these questions? What perspectives did you have? What inkling do you have now of an action you might take to complete this cycle? Now what? Now, as Roy said, we meet every morning at 8 o'clock Pacific time for 30 minutes, Monday through Friday. Somebody brings a wicked issue. And in that time, not only is the person who brings the issue learning and seeing, but the people who ask the questions also have their consciousness expanded and see and do in different ways. And all of those sessions, we started in March the 20th of uh, 2020. And we've done it every Monday through Friday since. And all of those are recorded and are on our website. And so as we close, I'll share that link with you. And you're welcome to come and join us in the Power of Questions. So Royce, I think we're ready to close and then we can get to some, I think they're gonna do a quick evaluation and then we can get to some questions. Can I do a right. plug? Can I, can I just do a plug for the, thir for the eight o'clock thing? Oh, sure. The magic of it is that you will have people from all kinds of different domains of life yeah. asking you questions. It's not just agile people. It's people who work with government, people who work in different countries, people who work with school systems, people who work with um, you name it. It's, it's yeah. really a wide variety of people who come to that. Yeah, Olaf, thanks for reminding me. Michael Spade also does one once a week with people who are Agilists mm -hmm. and they almost never talk about Agile. So, but once a week on Thursdays, Michael does that and it's a really interesting and powerful community. Yeah, people from all over the world. We usually have between eight and 15 people there. It's, it's delightful. Okay. Agile Fight Club, that's good job. Yeah. Because it is true what state, you know, what comes up at uh, questioning stays at question. Yeah. All right. So we, what we've had time to look at tonight are just a few of the ways that help us in HSD see the world around us, make sense of the world around us, and take action. And we call it our next wise action because it's the next thing we're going to do. It's not the last thing we're going to do about this wicked issue. It's just the next thing. And so we use adaptive action as we stand in inquiry and use things like the power of questions to find ways to expand how we see the challenge rather than lock us into the challenge thinking there's just one right answer. So we invite you to uh, go to our website and look these up or and find out more about them. Um, Glenda's gonna post the uh, the invitation to the uh, Power of Questions. We have these, our website is right here on the page. Um, we do adaptive action workshops where you come six hours, you learn kind of a deeper dive into a particular area. We do those once a month. Also once a month on Thursdays, there's, Glenda does a one hour webinar where she takes a deep dive into a single idea about HSD. You always walk away with a new tool. Those are uh, the first Thursday of every month and they're on the, you can find out about them on the website too, live virtual workshop. Um, then we also offer certification courses. That's what Olaf has done with us. He's been to some adaptive action. He is almost always at the live virtual workshop, but he also went through our certification program. Um, so we, we really uh, would welcome you to, to get into the website, look around, see what works, and be in touch with us. 
info at hscinstitute.org. Um, we look at that every single day and we respond. Uh, if you have questions or want more information or would like to know something else about us. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to the questions that might come up. Um, thank you to, to all of to rec for recommending us. Thanks for, to Lena for the wonderful help and guidance she gave us as we prepared. So, and thank you all for being here. Linda, do you have anything to add? Just, I'm curious about your being so quiet. I can't wait to hear your questions. Exactly. Well, because it was short but profound, so it's sinking in. <laughs> it is sinking in, and while it is sinking in, I guys will launch a poll uh, so you can answer a few simple questions, and our lovely speakers can get a glass of water or just take a deep breath. I do have a question, if I may ask. Go ahead. Um, you know, just trying to understand um, if we wanted to kind of like, is there any kind of sources or underpinnings in which you, the two of you develop um, HSD? You know, what, what, what is your main influences in, in, in creating this system, so to speak? That's a lovely question. So my background's in history and philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. And so I got quite interested in the mechanics of paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. So that set the stage. Mm -hmm. And then in the 80s, I did um, computer technical training and documentation and GUI design and various things. I was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And in the late 1980s, I got stuck mm -hmm. with business problems that did not behave, that the world was changing faster than I could as a leader. And so I was just desperate for some way to think about leading my organization. And at that point, there was nothing in the management literature that was useful. Either it was too constrained and controlling, or it was too touchy-feely for me. And there was just nothing in the middle that would suit my needs. So as an escape read, I picked up um, Making a New Chaos, Making a New Science, James Glick's first book about complexity. Some of you may have read it. And in the first chapter, <clears throat> I realized, oh my gosh, that describes this problem. And oh, that one. And as I read, I realized that this body of work reflected the challenges in the world I lived in. Mm. And that started this life's work of seeing what patterns there are, understanding them in some way that's useful, and then taking action. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, ours is like other complexity approaches. Um, the main distinction is that it's so practical and useful and prospective. Often complexity work is retrospective. In fact, almost all complexity scientists can see complexity in the rearview mirror, but they can't know in this moment what to do because there's no certainty about it. Um, and so in my doctorate, I reviewed 15 different approaches to nonlinear dynamics in various mathematics and scientific disciplines and found this commonality among them, the CDE, which is the pattern logic, which was common to all of them. And that's become the foundation of the work. It's a good question. It looks like- yeah, Thank Andrew, you. The, the, oh, you uh, sorry, I just wanted to comment, but thank you. Yeah, there's a certain uh, uh, aliveness to the way you're doing it, you know, because it's alive, it's the, the problems are here and now and not mm -hmm. some, it's, we're not doing a postmortem. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I can tell you, as Linda was going through that, I was working as an administrator in a school district in the uh, northwest part of the United States. And I would, it, she would come and say, I learned this new thing. And I would say, that's great, because that helps me understand what happened Thursday, right? And so 
the the way and all I can tell you this the way that HSD works best is in action. So you can't wake, walk your you can't think your way through it. You have to do something in action. You have to say, okay, I'm just going to try this, do an adaptive action, and see what you see. Uh, so it it is. Thanks for noticing that. We it's very it is a lie. It is a lie. Yeah, thank Andrew, you. Andrew, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, Amanda Royce, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, full transparency, um, I'm a Dave Snowden blessed Canovin trainer and uh, Canovin permeates my every thought. Congratulations. All right, thank you. Um, one of Dave's great moves is if you're in a situation of uh, complexity, emergence, to ask yourself, well, what can we change? And then ask of what we can change, what can we monitor? And then of what we can monitor, what can we amplify if beneficial or dampen if harmful? Which is wonderful. And it and a lot of what you've talked about this evening sounds like just a different perspective, or almost exactly the same way of thinking. Except there's an assumption in it which is that what one can monitor is actually within one's scope of awareness. And um, I think, Glenda, you kind of hinted at it by mentioning James Glick's work and chaos theory, that we're seeing, we're living in a world now where we're living with the outcome of the law of unintended consequences. We're living with a climate crisis that basically has occurred as a result of being dismissed as negative externalities. Have you in HSD found any approaches, anything that actually helps develop awareness in organizations for those things that they could be blind to given the, you know, the rush into growth and the pressures of the market mm -hmm. and all of, you know, the organizational pressures? The short answer is yes. Good. <laughs> the long yeah. answer is the long answer is come to London and get certified. No, that's a joke. Right. That's a joke. Right. Right. <laughs> um, briefly, I can say that when von Bertalanffy wrote General Systems Theory, he says very clearly in the first chapter, "This is about closed yeah. systems." Hmm. Full stop. And. Open systems are what we have in human systems. And so the pattern logic inquiry and adaptive action that we use is designed to give you thoughtful action, intentional action in open systems. And so all of the tools that we use are for that. Now, when we go to someone, a, a leader in an organization who is addicted to expertise, and power and privilege, the first thing we do is ask them what keeps them awake at night. Because mm. they all have at least one wicked issue. And that's where we start. Because if they will use these three tools on that particular wicked issue, it will shift. And then over time, they're willing to say, well, maybe it will go to a larger and larger system. So that in a nutshell, Andrew, is how we do our work. Yeah, I've got it. The moment that you can get someone that's addicted to certainty to actually acknowledge, I don't know, as a legitimate answer, yeah. you have a chance. Yeah. yeah, even if it's about something tiny. Mm. And often the, the wicked issue that they're willing to talk about, that they have to acknowledge at that moment, they're desperate because they've tried everything else. Nothing works. Then we can work on it. We're working, for example, with a group on the workforce issue in healthcare mm -hmm. in Western Canada. And it clearly is wicked. No one knows what to do. And that's a place to begin. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Feynman that said, I'd rather have a question I can't answer than an answer I can't question. Don't you love that's that? Right. Oh, yeah, yes. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. Lovely. Thank you. I want to tattoo that on my forehead. You know, one of the things, Andrew, in addition, is that we go, we, we deal with CEOs. But we also go in at other places in the organization, because what we find is that if, if a middle manager will use these three tools, 
or a, a department head will use these three tools. Then other people begin to notice and they look over and go, well, what, what's he doing or what's she doing or what are they doing? And, and it grows inside the system more organically. And so it doesn't have to only be the CEO and it doesn't have to only be the coaches or OD or whatever. It, it's wherever we can go where people will, who have things that keep them awake at night, who will use these three tools on those challenges, they see that they're different. And we've had people who have come because they work in a corporate setting and they say, but I could use this with my children or I could use this with my baseball team, my kid's baseball team or whatever. So okay. it's just getting people to realize that there's there are options for their action. Got it. Got it. And it's funny how you find humans almost everywhere, isn't it? It's isn't amazing. that interesting? And they're all alike and they're all incredibly different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And they all create patterns. Yeah. One of the things that makes it easy for people to bring in and apply HSD is that we are also an open system. Mm. So any tool you use, any process you know, anything that works, works because either it helps you see a pattern or it helps you understand it in some meaningful way or it helps you take action. And so you can take every single tool and product you use, you can use all of the, um, what are Keith's uh, liberating <laughs> structures? Mm -hmm. um, plug in to adaptive action, and that's fabulous. You can't have too many ways to do the work that needs to be done. So that's another reason that it mm -hmm. is easy to absorb. Yeah. Good. And if you're studying or you can look at that and yeah. say, oh, I, I can see fit. the CDE here, right? I can see adaptive action here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one, one of my mentors was fond of using an open space to start a transformation specifically so that, uh, that he and his sponsor could observe and spot the people who are most likely to be those that they could work with because then when they can do that they'll get a little success they've got a thread they can pull on other people will be like what are they doing that works why aren't we doing that and you're in business yeah yeah, yeah well and, and when you think about what how harrison did the open space work they're the people who pick choices are the differences that make a difference mm. they create small containers of these questions they're the exchanges that go around and they talk about these things. So it's working on the issues that make those systems human or yeah. that emerge from the system because it's human, whichever way you want to think about it. Yeah, that's great. I'm not seeing other hands raised. Is that because his questions were so good nobody else has any? I'm particularly curious about your experience from the power of questions. As you listen to the questions that Olaf and Royce and I asked, what happened for you in your wicked issue? And nothing is a perfectly acceptable answer. Well, for me, uh, it reminded me about what you said uh, somewhere uh, tonight. You said, uh, do your own work with courage. Mm -hmm. That's what came up for me when um, you guys were asking those questions. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I cheated. I actually asked you my wicked question. So, you know. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Be smart. Yeah. yeah. For anyone who'd like to see some of the derivation of some of the tools and a kind of core set of tools, we wrote a book in 2013 called Adaptive Action, Leveraging Uncertainty in Your Organization, which really is a kind of compendium of the tools and then examples of cases where they were used and then some 
projection of what we thought in 2013, they might be useful in larger other kinds of uh, discipline specific areas. So that might be helpful if you if this is tweaked your curiosity and you want to see kind of how they come together and how they fit. And when you go to the website, there's one page, there's several pages to it, but there's one that's about our learning opportunities. What can you go? How can you learn more? But then there's a page that says resources. And that page has blog posts from the last 20 years. It has all the um, sessions, adaptive actions. There are adaptive actions there. There are the live virtual workshops that Glenda's done. There are things that we've written. Um, there are case, a few little case studies. There's lots and lots and lots of information available there. Um, and you can use word search on that page by itself. So feel free. Logan, did you have a question? I see you came back on, on camera. OK, all right. I'm sort of eating up with curiosity so to know who you know in Singapore who is one of our associates. So I'm, a, I'm thinking maybe it's time for us to close. So we want to say thank you again to Olaf and to Alina and to all of you for joining with us and for practicing these tools to see, understand, and influence human systems to build possibility for all. What is your website address? It is www.hsdinstitute.org. And Royce, if you'll type it, because my typing I am. is not. Yeah, Royce knows. My, my yeah, typo, I there. typos my middle name. And Elena has a PDF of the slides we used tonight. And you're welcome to that. And if you ever want the real slides, just info at HSD, and I'll get them to you. There's one in particular, but she has the uh, PDF of the slide. We will share. And, and the website is in that too. Okay. Awesome. Anything else for the good of the world from us? Then Glenda and I will go away. Y'all can do whatever networking you want. Thank you so much. Just Thank you light. so much, guys. It was Thank incredible. You. And delight. Thank you. Enjoy Thank the uh, beach during uh -huh. the night. There are <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, we, yes, will. we will. Really, really Thank you all. Thank you all. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Just a second. Do we want to stop the recording? Hang. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Good point.